So I had the publishing company. And right. as part of that, I'm a member of SAS, in fact, I'm vice president of SAS Books, which is the Association of Saskatchewan Publishers. Yeah. And the, at their annual meeting, they brought in a publisher who talked about kickstarting an anthology. This would have been in April of 2019. Right. And I thought, hey, I know some authors. And then I <laughs> climbed the very steep learning curve as to how to make a Kickstarter work. Right. But I made it work. And uh, so the first Shapers of Worlds came out from Shadow Pop Press. Uh, in uh, 2019, fall of 2019, I got that one out, and I've done one every yeah. year since. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you, but navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 349 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In today's episode, I have an interview with Edward Willett. Edward Willett is an award-winning author of more than 60 books of science fiction, fantasy, and nonfiction for children and adults. He's also the host of the Aurora award-winning podcast, The World Shapers, Conversations with Science Fiction and Fantasy Authors. He successfully kickstarted and edited a series of anthologies under the Shapers of Worlds series, featuring authors who were guests during each year of his podcast. We talk about his writing, his podcast, his kickstarters, and the bold new ground he's breaking as a sole proprietor of his Shadow Paw Press, getting actual warehousing and bookstore distribution that breaks the shackles of the POD-only world that most indie authors play in. And all that's coming up later in this episode. But first, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by ScribeCount. Are you frustrated with trying to log into multiple different dashboards and see what your sales are? Do any in-depth analytics? Well, ScribeCount has got you covered. Basically, if you want to spend more of your time focusing on writing books and marketing your books rather than trying to see the effect of that marketing and that publishing, ScribeCount is a handy, easy tool where you can install a plugin to your browser and ScribeCount will securely pull your data from the various platforms that you log into. So for example, as an indie author, you may have a direct account with Amazon, and Apple, and Barnes and Noble, or Kobo, and Google. You may also use distributors like draft to digital Publish Drive, Smashwords. You may also sell books direct, linking through BookFunnel and other platforms. You may use Findaway Voices for your audio or Audible. So many different ways to look at all your sales, and that's, you know, at least half a dozen different dashboards. But what ScribeCount does is it pulls all that data in so you can look at your sales, get a quick glance to see where your books are selling, which platforms, which titles, which formats. If you have some titles that are exclusive through Kindle Unlimited, you can do a comparison. Kindle Unlimited versus your actual real live sales. You can even manually import titles. There's a spreadsheet you can fill out. I recently had a in-person event. I'm going to be doing at least another half dozen in-person events in the next few months. And that means I'm getting sales in on physical in-person sales that aren't really trackable. So when I'm trying to measure and understand my business and what titles are paying off and where I'm making money, I can use ScribeCount. I can also use ScribeCount to link it to my mail systems as well as places like Amazon ads so I can see if those ads are actually really paying for themselves. Again, the whole idea behind ScribeCount is to make it easy for you to see and manage your data so you can make smart marketing decisions. And more importantly, you can get back to what's really important, writing the next book. If you want to check out ScribeCount, you can check them out over at starkreflections.ca slash ScribeCount. Yes, that's my affiliate link where you can get access to ScribeCount and hey, 
costs you nothing, but I maybe get a few pennies for that process. Again, check out ScribeCount at starkreflections.ca slash ScribeCount and let them work for you so you can get back to writing more books and doing proper analytics in a single dashboard so you can make the most informed decisions in your writing career. And comments from recent episodes. Um, Edwin Downward over on the Twitter sphere said, uh, the latest Stark Reflections with Mark Leslie uh, highlighted another fascinating effort to approach the discoverability question from a new angle. This time, tackling the issue of helping readers find books that are being sold direct. This has been a big hole in need of filling. You're so right, Edwin. Thanks for sharing that. And that's what Amanda Bird talked about in episode 300. And 48 of the Stark Reflections podcast. Amanda and I talked about the new platform that she's recently launched called Authors Go Direct. And the key thing about that platform and getting into a new platform like that is you want to be there in the groundswell as things begin to build. So get in there early. Check it out if you haven't listened to episode 348. Just remember, Edwin reminded you of that in his Twitter reflection. If you want to leave reflections or comments, uh, even questions of the podcast, you can reach me over on the Twitter sphere. I'm at Mark Leslie. You can also email me, mark at markleslie.ca, or better yet, leave comments uh, for the podcast over at uh, youtube.com slash markleslielefebvre or at starkreflections.ca. When it comes to personal updates, this has been an absolutely chaotic time for me. I'm still not recovered from the week I spent in Colorado Springs a couple weeks ago in terms of playing catch up on my own personal writing. Uh, I'm still a, a really tight deadline uh, for the novel. Fortunately, I'm working with an editor who really understands and cares about me and is so damn flexible uh, that we're working on that. I'm basically getting it edited piece by piece as I release you know, <laughs> new words each day. It's going to be a really tight one. I don't want to have to take advantage of of pushing uh, the release date off. I've already pushed it back 30 days and I don't want to lose, I guess, my uh, pre-order privileges at Amazon. So really hoping to get that done. I've got a whole bunch of in-person events coming up. For example, on yeah, uh, and the, you know, this episode will be coming out just before it. I'm going to be live with George Nuri of the Coast to Coast AM, and that's syndicated in what 800 different radio stations across North America, mostly in the U.S. Uh, you know, maybe a dozen or two dozen stations in Canada. It's a three-hour program. It starts at uh, I guess it's 11 p.m. Pacific time on Friday, March 1st, but it will be starting for me at 1 a.m. Eastern on Saturday, March 2nd, and I'll be going, it's a three-hour uh, program, so uh, I'll be up very late, very, very late. It's a three-hour program that uh, is, is lots of fun. I've been on Coast to Coast AM uh, with George several times. I got a call from his uh, production manager uh, a week and a half ago, I, uh, and, and she just said, hey, Mark, it's been a long time. It's Did you realize it's almost been two years since you've been on the show? And I went, oh, my God, wow, really? I said, well, do you have, do you have anything you, you need to talk about? We've got an opening coming up. And uh, and I said, well, I don't have the book out yet, but I am working on uh, Spirits Untapped, Haunted Bars and Breweries. So we're going to be talking. Obviously, we'll talk about haunted locations. There's even an open phone line. Uh, always so much fun. Uh, pretty pretty tiring, uh, but always a lot of fun uh, to do that show. And I've got lots of great stories that I have been collecting all these years about haunted uh, bars and breweries. So that's going on. There's several um, anthologies. Um, I, I've just recently released a couple short pieces of writing for other collaborative projects with other authors. <laughs> I'll be talking about that when, the, when they're uh, ready for prime time very shortly. And uh, also... A couple other anthologies for short stories that I want to write for. That is not to mention the work that I'm doing on uh, a collection I'm editing. And I'm gearing up for this fall. This October will be the 20th anniversary of the release of my very first book. A self-published One Hand Screaming in 2004 is when I released that short story collection. So I'm doing 
the 20th anniversary edition. I'm, I'm going to launch that with a Kickstarter, but I'm also doing something special for that book as well as one of the other ones I'm publishing through Stark Publishing. And it's kind of related to what Ed and I talk about in this episode, so I won't get into that just yet. But among that, there are several other things that I'm doing to advance and move my author business forward, including something that I will be sharing with the awesome folks who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash dark reflections because I just interviewed somebody who'll be coming up in several weeks. Uh, the, the interview will be coming up in several weeks because I have so many in the queue. But what I'm going to do is for my patrons, I'm going to give you a bit of a sneak peek of, of that awesome guest as well as a special coupon code that gets you 20% off. Uh, and this is an opportunity that allows you to get into sort of an online agent marketplace, agency marketplace, where you may be able to sell to agents from around the world your uh, translation rights or foreign, uh, either foreign language rights or some other rights as well. Not often do the movie or other media rights come through there, but that is a platform that people have purchased uh, movie and media rights uh, through. So again, groundbreaking stuff for indie authors. It'll be coming up in a future episode of the podcast. But of course, I thought I'd give that extra coupon code. And the coupon code will be coming to all listeners, but I want to get that out to my awesome patrons first so you guys can take advantage of it with a huge thank you for supporting me over at starkreflections.ca slash... No, that's not it. That's not the URL. I got it backwards. <laughs> over at patreon.com slash starkreflections. I guess I... I should make a URL that's starkreflections.ca slash Patreon. Uh, maybe I do have that, and that's where the people are listed, and then it links back to Patreon? I'll double-check that, and we'll find out, I guess. If you go to that URL and there's nothing there, then obviously I didn't check it uh, or wasn't aware of what was going on. But in any case, that's it for the introductory matter. That's it for my personal update. Let's roll in to this interview with Edward Willett of Shadow Paw Press. Hey, Edward, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm so thrilled to get a chance to chat with you again. And, and so many times we've chatted offline or, or, or I had the privilege of interviewing you on behalf of the virtual When Words Collide conferences when you were a guest of honor a couple of years ago now. But I want to talk to you about uh, initially I want to start off with your background uh, as a writer and where it all started for you. Well I began as a reader as most of us do uh, and somewhere along in there I was 11 years old I decided to write a short story that was my first short story and it was called Castra Glass Hypership Test Pilot which gives you a pretty good idea of where my brain was <laughs> very wow. very early on. <laughs> wow and that's like a James Allen Gardner kind of title for a short yeah, story I isn't it? it is. I, 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 the name was Castra Glass because I had gotten it into my head that science fiction had to have weird names that's what I had gotten out of all my reading at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and I just kept writing. I wrote longer and longer stuff in high school and somewhere along in there. I mean, I had many interests, uh, music and, and acting right. and art and science. And, you know, I could have gone in many different directions. But at some point, I foolishly decided I would focus on writing <laughs> instead of engineering. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I started as a newspaper reporter. I got my degree in journalism and started as a newspaper reporter at the Weyburn Review in my hometown newspaper. Worked as a newspaper reporter and editor for eight years. Kept writing. Uh, sold my first short story during those years of my 20s. It wasn't science fiction. Even my first short story was a little historical story about two kids caught in a snowstorm in Saskatchewan. Wow. It was published in the Western Producer magazine. <laughs> called wow, Western so your Keeper. first story was like more like literary <laughs> adventure i would have called it adventure, oh, adventure yes. literary adventure but although historical. interestingly yeah. later i did sell a science fiction story to western people the western producer magazine really? uh, probably the only one they ever published and did they know it was science fiction or did you sneak it in well, it was pretty Africa clear does? it's about uh it's it, it came out of being a newspaper reporter it's called strange harvest and we used to get people bringing in weird looking vegetables okay in fact i did a whole photo spread once of these weird looking you know tomatoes that look like john yeah. diefenbaker that sort of thing <laughs> Probably not a tomato. He would have been more a potato, probably. More of a anyway. potato. Yeah, Diefen, Diefen, <laughs> Diefen Baker's more of a potato, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> so all the, all, the, all the Americans are going, what? Who? Yeah, yeah. Well, look <laughs> it up. So 
<laughs> I uh, I had done actually a photo feature called Strange Harvest, and that's where the idea came from. And it was about this small town newspaper reporter, Mark, write what you know, yeah. who uh, people are bringing in these strange vegetables. They're really strange. They're like exploding tomatoes and tear gas oh. onions and things like that. Oh, so like Monty Python, uh, the box of chocolates meets... Uh... <laughs> yeah, something Local like that. newspaper reporter. Okay. And it turns out that there's an alien invasion in, by intelligent plants and in that they are creating these uh these things as weapons to be used against the the uh, the animals who are oppressing the plants <laughs> this was long before i heard the arrogant worm song about carrot juice's murder so and um yeah and it was been very successful actually that story was reprinted and it was turned into an audio version and broadcast nationally on cbc radio and wow so it's actually in many ways my most successful science fiction story but it was probably the only one ever published in an agricultural <laughs> magazine wow, anyway that's... i kept writing other stuff and then um and i i quit being a newspaper reporter be i became communications officer for the saskatchewan science center here in regina that's what brought me up here and then 30 what is this 2024 or so 36 years ago last is that right something 30 30 years ago i guess last year 30 uh, years ago I... it was the 70s right <laughs> yeah, no, unfortunately. 1993, whenever that was, yeah. I quit my job and became a full-time freelance writer. And uh, I didn't publish, I was publishing a few short stories here and there in small magazines, right. but I was writing nonfiction. And my first published book was actually using Microsoft Publisher for Windows 95, followed by the sequel using Microsoft Publisher for Windows 97. Wow, so look at that. <laughs> I wrote computer books for a while. I wrote a lot of nonfiction for children's publishers, educational books. I wrote about a bunch of diseases. I wrote a biography of the Ayatollah Khomeini at one point, uh, all this stuff. But I was writing fiction, and gradually it started to, to get sold. And I finally got a book. It was first published by a small publisher called... Uh, what were they called? Five Star. And uh, that catered to the library market almost exclusively. But that book was picked up in paperback by Daw Books in New York. And uh, since then, I've had 12 novels with Daw okay. and uh, then a bunch of other stuff. And of course, I also started my own publishing company and have published a few things through there and now publishing a lot of other people as well. So Basically, I quit my job and, and started writing, and now it's anything for a buck that involves words. <laughs> awesome, awesome. <laughs> we'll, we'll write a limerick for a buck. Um, so, so let's let's get into uh, I, one of the one of the first things I remember, you know, chatting with you about early on was your creation of, I mean, the the podcast, right? Mm. The um, the World Shapers podcast. And, and, and was that, what was that driven out of? What was that like, because you were already freelance writing, you were selling books to publishers, you were selling short stories. And then you're like, I, I don't have enough work to do. I'm going to start this podcast. Is that, was that the journalist in you that wanted that? Uh, maybe a little bit. I, even though I was focused on writing, I have had, excuse me, have done quite a bit of broadcasting as well. Okay. So for 10 years, I hosted a Peter show here in Regina on uh uh, Net Talk, it was called, which is on Access Communications, our local cable channel, which was a phone-in show about computers. And uh, my job was really just being the host. And they would ask a question, and I'd go, that's a very interesting question, Bob, and throw it to the guy next to me who was the actual <laughs> expert. But anyway, I did that for a long time, and I hosted a radio program about the arts here called our, uh, oh, why did we call that? I don't remember anymore. Uh, and I was on CBC Radio uh, for 17 years doing a weekly science column and then they decided that was too long for one person to be on so that was all freelance but i was wow. so i i had the you know you may be able to tell i'm very comfortable talking <laughs> yeah yeah and and you have a great voice uh for it as well so does that mean did you you obviously these are the days where you went in the studio you didn't have the equipment in your home yeah right? like that, for right? the most part i mean we would occasionally go on location the colin grew was the host and he'd like to get out of the studio if he could but it was a tape machine that we took out into the you know, to go tobogganing or talk about the science of skating and go skating on the lake or things like that. Right. Um, but anyway, I had all that experience. And so when podcasts started to show up, I thought immediately, oh, I might do that, but I never had a real reason to. Right. Uh, but I also really enjoyed talking to writers. And so two things happened in 2018. Um, my novel World Shaper <laughs> came out from <laughs> Daw Books, which ended up being a three book series. And I hope to write more, but it'll be putting it out myself if I do. Right. And uh, I thought, well, if this is an opportunity, because the whole premise of the book is about people shaping worlds. And that's what authors do. And I thought, I can tie that together, I can boost 
the signal on the new book and also indulge my enjoyment in talking with authors about process. And so for the first 150 episodes, The World Shapers is me interviewing authors about uh, the creative process. And okay. I've talked to some of the biggest names in the field and that all, that's what started it. And I, I, and also I'd been in the field long enough that I knew people. <laughs> so I was able to say, uh, Rob, Rob Sawyer, you want to be my first guest? And Tanya, you, you know, I know you through DAW. Julie Shaneda, I know you. <laughs> oh, Todd oh, yeah. I know you. <laughs> so those are my first four guests, which wasn't a bad start for a new podcast. No, I know big, big name authors. Uh, and, and, and many of, uh, most of them DAW authors. I, I don't know if Rob ever, published with Don. No. I know he's been with a bunch I of know to John Scalzi. He was tour, of yeah. course. And yeah, I have talked to quite a few authors, but I've talked to people of all different publishing persuasions. So that uh, so that so that was in in conjunction with the release of the first book in the World Shapers yeah. uh, series. And what year was that again? Uh, 2018. So 2018. So that was the first uh, the, the, the tie in and the first 150 episodes was about the creative process with authors how did that podcast evolve over time then uh, what, what well, it was has it? just evolved uh 150 seemed like a nice round number and okay. i've now gone to this format where there's a, a video component i started that almost by well i knew i was going to do it but it ended up i was interviewing a fellow named richard sparks who's quite a remarkable writer he he wrote like uh, the he was one of the writers on the secret policeman's other ball by okay John Cleese and you know, he knows all those British comedy types and a comedy writer. And anyway, he's a great guy to talk to. And it happened that we couldn't get my audio to work that day. So we ended up doing Zoom. And uh, that was kind of my first one. I, but I had intended to switch to video anyway. And I started with Rob Sawyer, my first guest in the original. Right. But the, the focus has shifted now to new releases, talking to authors about their newest books, a little bit uh -huh. less about process, although that still comes up, obviously. Right. And I also wanted to expand the genres a little bit. So I, I will be talking to authors. Uh, I'm starting with a lot of science fiction, and there will always be a lot of science fiction and fantasy authors. Right. But I want to be able to talk to other authors and other genres, especially the ones that I publish. Oh, so. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that's true. It's it's another medium for uh, for getting that out. And, then, and so that leads to, before we get into your publishing, because where you actually created a publishing uh, empire, you created some spin-off books from the podcast. Can can you talk a little bit about sort of where what the genesis of that was? Well, actually, the two things are related. I started Shadow Pop Press earlier in 2018 okay. because I had two books I wanted to put out. One was my own collection of short fiction. I had I don't write a lot of short fiction, but I had finally, after 30 or 40 years, got enough right. to put out a book. Uh, Paths to the Stars, and uh, I also had my grandfather-in-law's first World War memoirs. Okay. Uh, that he had written late in life and they were around the house this is his house we live in there are still books on the bookshelf back there that he got through the book of the month club <laughs> oh wow <laughs> and all sorts of things around here that belong to them and i knew i wanted to put that out i put it online without any editing or anything but i wanted to make a book out of it which i did and i got right. it out in time for the armistice uh, centennial in 2018 so i had the publishing company and right. as part of that, I'm a member of Sask. In fact, I'm vice president of Sask Books, which is the Association of Saskatchewan Publishers. Yeah. And the, at their annual meeting, they brought in a publisher who talked about kickstarting an anthology. This would have been in April of 2019. Right. And I thought, hey, I know some authors. And then I climbed <laughs> the very steep learning curve as to how to make a Kickstarter work. Right. But I made it work. And uh, so for the first Shapers of Worlds came out from Shadow Pop Press. Uh, in uh, 2019, fall of 2019, I got that one out, and I've done one every yeah. year since. Wow! And uh, I always feature like one year's worth of authors uh, who were on the podcast. Who were on the podcast? Yeah, and and I'm and I'm lucky enough. I'm just holding up a copy of uh, Volume Four, which comes out January 23rd. January 23rd is the uh, commercial release date. Yeah. yeah, and and this basically features uh, authors from the previous years podcast uh, episodes as well okay wow and so this was um this was a, a kickstarter as well yep and so the kickstarter is uh obviously the kickstarter uh people get it a lot earlier than the regular release uh well it depends some years like last year the way it worked out i think the backers got it about the same time it went out uh this right. year um my release was delayed because of other publishing concerns. And that allowed me actually to do what you should do, which is get it out to the backers first. So they get a right. bit of a, you know, benefit from being a backer. So let's as talk well as the, all the rewards and things that they get. So let's talk a little bit about the evolution of Shadow Paw Press. So you had a collection of stories, you know, previously published stuff, you put them together as a volume, you had grandfather's uh, work that you wanted to release in time for an anniversary. 
Mm-hmm. But then Shadow Pop Press became this anthology, but but it's become something more. And 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 I and I want to I want to draw attention to this because most of us indie authors who embrace the technology and 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 you leverage it to get our books out into the world in a digital fashion uh you know we, we kind of stop at ebooks and print on demand and maybe some audio distribution but but you kind of <laughs> just renaissance man couldn't stop there you had to go even further could you talk a little bit about how how that evolution happened in shadow pop press oh I, yeah I'll... <laughs> so originally all I was going to do was self-publish yeah. my short story collection and and self-publish, although it wouldn't be me, but I would have been an editor of the but there's a publisher here in town, a Heather Nickel at your Nicholsworth Press, which is a hybrid publisher. And I'd worked with her on a couple of projects where I was a writer, uh, like for the Government House History book I'd written, she'd published, and I put out a poetry book, in fact, that she published. Um and she said, no, no, what you ought to do is start a publishing company. So, okay, <laughs> which I did. And uh, even then, it wasn't much different than any, you know, independent publisher who puts a name on their publishing company. I was still kind of doing that. And it was all ebook and print on demand. And in fact, after that first year, my focus was mostly on stuff, and I still have some I haven't published, where the rights have reverted to me because I have metaphorically killed a number of publishers over the years. At least they publish me and they go out of business. I try not <laughs> to take that personally. Uh, so I, these rights have reverted to me. So I still have some of those. But um, then uh, there, I was writer in residence in Saskatoon at the Saskatoon Public Library, and I was I worked with a, num- a couple of authors there whose books I thought, you know, were, were really good, could be really good. And so I had mentioned to one of them that I'd be interested perhaps in publishing her book. And uh, then I, Matthew Hughes, uh, who has been on the podcast and of course, very well-known Canadian writer of science fiction and fantasy and mysteries and other things. I, I think he approached me and he had this novella, YA novella, which he was interested in. And so that was kind of when I first started publishing other authors, other than the authors that are in the, the anthology, obviously. And then I got the bright idea that uh, there might be, there are a lot of books that go out of sight because their publisher goes away, as I had reason to know. Yes. And I thought, you know, probably not as much work putting out a reprint. Maybe there's still a market for that. My original thought was, oh, this will be no work at all putting out a reprint. But I couldn't actually do that because I am un- incapable of reprinting a book without re-editing it. So <laughs> it didn't actually work that way. Right. But I started bringing out reprints. Now there's a like a publisher here, Kato Books, major publisher that went mm-hmm. under. They'd published me, in fact, at my young adult fantasy series, and uh, so I picked up several of their books and reprints. And so that was another line. I've also had like one of their books that they published, but the author added another 31 poems to it. So although it's a reprint, it's also a new edition, right. the first English translation of a book previously published in France. It's a reprint, but it's also a new edition. And so I've, I continued to do reprints, and then I decided to open up tentatively to more new titles and have picked up a couple that are also coming out in the near future. Uh, there's a book called The Good Soldier by Nir Yaniv. He lives in Los Angeles, Israeli-born author, and uh, it's a mash meet starship troopers in outer space is the best way to describe it, military <laughs> okay. science fiction satire. <laughs> And of course, he's drawing on his required military service in Israel when he lived there. Right. Uh, and um, also a YA far future, well, not far future, YA dystopian science fiction novel called The Headmasters by Mark Morton, who's a professor at uh, University of Waterloo and well-known nonfiction writer. And so those are coming out right away. And then I started picking up more stuff. And so this year I am taking on probably far too much. Yeah. But um, we'll see what happens. And because I was doing all that, I thought, and I always had it in the back of my mind, I would like to have some sort of bookstore distribution. And uh, because I've now done all this and worked with a number of people, I was able to get membership first in the Association of Canadian Publishers, uh, which represents independent publishers, yeah. you know, traditional publishers across the country. Yeah. And then I also managed to get membership in LPG Canada, Literary Press Group Canada. And through them, I have access to their distribution arm, Lit Distco, and I have a sales force and all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I'm also discovering is that it's a lot of work for one person and a cat. Yeah, no kidding. That is incredible. And I know like some of the books, um, you're, you're reprinting some of Arthur Slade's 
stuff. Yep. You've got the print rights to Rob Sawyer's uh, well, Audible bestseller. Like it's just charting on Audible, uh, the downloaded, uh, and 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 you're going to be releasing the the print edition of that book, which is yep. kind of a that's a pretty big deal, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with that. That's for sure. Yeah. That one. But again, the scale becomes bigger. So I'm yeah. doing, I have a company that I can do very small print runs through. And the most I've done mostly is like maybe 250 copies up front. But they're also, they're called Rapido. And they actually reprint, can reprint things very quickly if you need Yeah, to. I know. And and they distribute ARCs for you. They can actually yeah. do that distribution. They work with uh, some major Canadian publishers to do some of their some of their uh, work as well. I've used them for a number of projects. Great company to work with. I call them Rapido because I, yes. I add yeah, the French sure flair like because that, they are from Quebec. But, uh, but uh, um, I'm an American to begin with, and it's Rapido as far as I'm Rapido, concerned. Rapido, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but but let, let, let's talk a little bit about the Association of Canadian Publishers because a lot of independent presses, uh, indie authors who who create their imprints and, and, and do stuff, they don't go as far as becoming an official member in a professional organization like the Association of Canadian Publishers or the Literary Press Group of Canada. I mean, but that that requires an investment, but then also to get distribution through Lit Disco, to actually get warehousing, which which is the one thing most indie authors yeah. never have, and small publisher, a lot of really, really micro presses, they don't have that distribution. That had to have been a significant investment up front, right? Uh, it's... Investment up front is not that huge. The challenge is that you have to qualify. Um, right. And uh, and so how do you qualify? Like, what did you have to prove? You had to prove that you actually pay authors. You had to prove that. that yeah, you, you have to prove that you're doing things right. And you had to have recommendation from members. So I got a recommendation from uh, John Kennedy here at Radiant Press in Regina, right. whom I've known for a long time. In fact, he's the one that would have liked to publish the Headmasters, but doesn't have a YA line. So he passed it along to me. Right. And Dave at... I can't, I can't remember his name last name at ECW Press was my other. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave, Dave at ECW uh, was my other recommendator. Recommendator. Recommendation. Recommendator. Yeah. Wait, do, have you, there we you, go. Have you sold books to ECW, or did you just know Dave through the community? No, I've approached him, and uh, you know, I'd love to because oddly enough, my oldest, my middle brother's initials are DAW, so I've been published by DAW, and my initials are ECW. So I would love to be published by ECW Press, <laughs> but I've never quite found the right project <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and if there was a jlw which is my oldest brother's initials i'd totally go for them too <laughs> <laughs> well that's uh, does dave know that <laughs> <laughs> i think i mentioned it yeah okay i don't think awesome. it's enough of a selling point for them to you know oh we'll publish whatever you said to, to you yeah, know i mean an ecw has done some some incredible books uh, over the yeah. years non-fiction fiction um even even science fiction uh, as well yeah sparingly well, I've, of course i've been not, in contact not with them quite a lot over the years but i've never found something to that, really that actually program. Won. So you had to get some recommendations in order to in order to become a member, right, yeah. of the group, of, and that's the Association of Canadian Publishers. So you needed a what two recommendations from existing members? I or? think that was it. That's that's what I got. So that must have been what I needed. <laughs> yeah, of course. No, I, I got a dozen. I only needed two. So, um, but then but then also you have to you actually have to do a, a, a larger print run than just you know, a handful of copies in order to to have the books in in warehousing, right? Yeah, well, there's not actually with LPG. I mean, LPG was a whole nother process. You really have yeah. to have a publishing record and a number of things there. I mean, it's all on their website, the sort of things yeah. you have to, have to qualify with. And I didn't qualify for a long time. I approached them very early on yeah, uh, as a possibility because I was always looking for distribution of some sort. I should mention for small distribution, I did have a small distributor uh, called Alpine Book Peddlers, uh, which actually had moved book a few packages, books out book to bookstores peddlers? and things too. Yeah, Alpine Book Peddlers. They're based okay. in Camrose, I think. Okay. Uh, somewhere in Alberta. I think it was Camrose. One of those C. Oh, it started with a C. <laughs> Starts with a C in Alberta. That's a small list. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you should be able to find it. Uh, Not Calgary. <laughs> Not Calgary. No, it's one of the small Cs. Okay. Um, anyway, they... they uh, took me on and and so there was I they sent I sent them very small numbers but they did move a few books for me which was very nice uh and actually even with LPG like for my back titles I think I only provided them with eight copies of the back oh okay titles. it's not like you need a minimum of a hundred copies or a thousand copies or anything like that it, no I don't think there's an absolute minimum yeah. their concern is that you have enough that you can meet orders and then yeah rapido helps with that because uh 
even if there's a because you get a regular report and they yeah. say well you know we're short we don't have enough copies to fill this order you can get them there within 10 days or something with rapido oh yeah because uh, they have like a digital printing it's sort of a combination of offset uh, <laughs> sort of <laughs> yeah yeah I, don't, I have no idea i've never been yeah. there i just uh, deal with them on email and i'm also like the downloaded i'm actually getting printed by freezons which is a much bigger publisher because i'm yeah you're going to need more copies on. of that up yeah. front i'm sure yeah and and that in freezons is usually when you're looking at a minimum of a thousand copies i imagine yeah yeah i mean the they will print less but uh, the yeah. economics are better, of course, the more you print, assuming you sell them. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, was there any requirement for you to have to apply for grants from, I mean, Canada Council for the Arts is really amazingly supportive. They do so much for us. Mm -hmm. But was that something that you had to navigate as well? Or did you just go, eh, I got this? <laughs> no, no. Well, I I did to begin with, but I, I have applied and gotten some grants. I got a uh, marketing and development grant through Creative Saskatchewan, which is quite supportive of publishers. And they also have a book production grant. Now that one was tricky because I missed the deadline because I was not yet a member of LPG and didn't think oh. I would qualify for the grant. So once I got the membership, I immediately applied and they put me on a waiting list. And okay. so I didn't get the full amount I would have liked to have gotten, but they did support me uh, going into this year. I just applied for a Saskatchewan Arts Board grant called a Professional Artist's uh, well, I don't know. It's P A O P. I don't remember what it stands right, for. Right, right. Uh, but that that's like next year at the best. But if I got that for a couple of years, I might be able to get core funding through Saskatchewan Arts Board. Canada okay. Council has so far so far told me that I'm not a real publisher. So wow, um, with all those memberships and the you're taking yourself. yeah, I'm sure I'll get there. But uh, so far, yeah, it's like you're not publishing enough Canadians. Or I mean, I I, I mentioned the anthology. Said, well, they're not all Canadians, are they? No, they're not all Canadians. Uh, <laughs> there's enough and of them. Last I heard, Canada Council, uh, in their last round, there were only like two publishers west of Ontario that got anything. Really? So there's a lot of <laughs> oh, extra on Canada Council. Oh, oh, that divisiveness too, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. so. Anyway, but I will. I am, of course, that's the other thing you have to do. And it's like, this is going to be a make or break year. Either I can yeah. make it work. Yeah. Or I will have run out of money and I'll go back to being a print on demand and self publish. Well, 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 I'm I'm hoping uh I, I want to I want to support and prop this up because I just love what you're doing and, and I want to see it hugely successful. So uh, I guess the the other question, and, and again, neither of us are lawyers or uh or accountants, but is this something where you had established a, a business registered with the province of Saskatchewan. And then, yeah. and then do you actually manage all of the money separate from Edward Willett, the writer who sells books to publishers? Well, no, because I mean, I do have a business, but I'm a sole proprietorship. And okay. as far as the tax people are concerned, it's all my money that's coming in from whatever. Okay. I didn't know if you, from. I know in some, in some places. I do keep, yeah. I do keep Saddle Pop Press has its own account and all the money. I try to keep all the money flowing in so that I can right. manage that side of things. But as far as me personally, it is all kind of one big thing. And it's one of the things I actually have another company, uh, publishing services company called Endless Skybooks, which is more of the hybrid model. Yeah. Uh, and uh, actually what's interesting about that though is that and it's very selective like I don't take books on there that I wouldn't publish anyway right uh, but uh, it's uh, distributed alongside Shadowpaw Press books as an imprint of Shadowpaw Press so oh, okay. uh, that's something that a lot of hybrid publishers can't offer and that I can offer as well that's true and, because they're they're usually doing only print on demand uh, yeah. and, and not and not what I call actual legit <laughs> bookstore distribution <laughs> so i picked up some interesting titles there that uh you know and i'm very upfront i mean i i try to make a br very bright line between the two if somebody submits to shadow yeah. press i don't say well i can't take it here but i'll take it over there yeah but give me some money and i'll print it for you <laughs> yeah i just say <laughs> so, yeah. I, I can't take it over there i might say you can look at this but i don't try to make any push for it but i've yeah. had i mean like there's a book called uh, the school of the haunted river that came to me there which came to me from d hobsbawm smith who's uh the poet laureate of Saskatchewan right now and very wow. well respected writer and editor. And, and uh, she just chose to bring it to me. It's by a, a deceased author that uh, she wow. kind of was the exec literary executor for, I guess you'd say. Um, and I've got a, a memoir of uh, a logger uh, that came to me because of somebody I met at Windwards Collide that she'd been working with him and thought that that was the best model wow. for them. 
Um, so yeah, I'm doing interesting stuff on that side too. So, like, so, so it's that, just me and the cat <laughs> and it's just you. I mean, that, that, that is uh wow. Where do you find the time? So the, the, the question I have about that is if somebody is interested and says, Oh, wait, and what's the name of the hybrid publishing? Uh, endless sky books. So endless sky books. You don't just take anything. So if it looks like something that you would publish, is that something that an author says, Oh, I want to have that extra distribution what's roughly what's sort of the cost or how does the cost structure work to uh if you were accepted in that in that imprint i should say i also do just i've also done just straightforward helping people self-publish because i've jumped through yeah. all the hoops myself and i know the process right. and can help people with that um and i would do that for a book that i wouldn't distribute but if somebody just wanted help for anything pretty much yeah i would be happy to do it for a fee of which course. is 65 dollars an hour canadian is what i charge and it's okay. all worked out an hour that's so what i do is i provide I look at what work is involved. I provide an upfront quote that I will not exceed, even if I've misjudged it. Right. So you know that it won't cost more than that. And yeah. if I actually am more efficient than I think I'm going to be, I will I only charge the hours, not what the actual. Oh, wow. Work. Wow. So uh, that seems like a, a publishing, a hybrid publishing with uh, incredible integrity. <laughs> <laughs> so I was very concerned about that. And in fact, yeah, I decided not to call it hybrid publishing because there is yeah and in a way Stigma. it is in a way it isn't because it's, yeah you know, so i call it a publishing services company I, and uh i've yeah i picked up about four or five titles there and maybe a, another one coming but and, that could be a way to help supplement the income for the other publishing and, and you're very upfront with with the the fees it's not like this hidden and you're not selling a ten thousand dollar marketing package that's completely no. useless and the <laughs> so. other but the other thing that i offer is i do have uh publicist on retainer mickey mickelson from creative edge publicity yeah uh, represents all of my authors from both yep. um, shadow <laughs> press or in the sky books and he finds a number of podcast interviews and things like that yep. uh and uh, so I, I do offer that and I, you just to back up to what it's costing i think what has been fairly typical has been it also depends on how many print books the author wants to yeah. buy of course yeah but the, the actual publishing process and everything is like 1500 to two thousand dollars for a novel is what it seems to be coming out that usually is average sized book not necessarily yeah wow uh so cool so there's so many layers uh so many intricate layers every time i talk to you i learn so much more <laughs> about <laughs> and wonder when uh, edward sleeps so as we get close to wrapping up is there any advice you would offer to either beginning writers looking to sell their work self-publish their work or even writers who've already done some of that work and are interested in maybe I want to become a publisher. What what are some words of advice or words of caution that you may uh, put out there? Don't become a publisher. There's no money in it. Okay. All right. No, it's good <laughs> advice. Good advice. Very good uh, advice, actually. Like I said, the only way that I can possibly survive is, is if I continue to get grants. And I philosophically always wonder why the heck should the government be giving me money to do something I want to do. And so philosophically, I'm not actually all that behind the idea of grants, but at the same time, as my wife says, well, they're giving the money, so you might as well <laughs> have some of yeah, it. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, uh, but really, and, and, you know, and I also, I'm on the publishing association and I talk to publishers a lot and yeah, we're all in the same boat. It's not a, it's not a particularly profitable business. Um, so my advice is, I guess, you have to have other reasons to do it than to make money. Some people do make money. I know that. Okay. Some people make a lot of money. There are self-published authors who make more money than the best-selling authors on the New York Times list, you know. Um, so that can work, but that can't be the reason you're doing it because it's just too fraught with risk and, and things. You have to want to do it because you have a story to tell or you have something you want to get out there into the world and you want to reach out to other people. You want to communicate ideas to other people. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the only real reason. And why do I do it? Because I just, I love getting like the book you just held up. I love when those show up and I know I made this and it didn't exist until I made it happen. And I think that's the ultimate reward. That is so inspiring. Edward, where can people find out more about you? Where can they find out more about Shadow Paw Press and your podcast and all the things? I have multiple websites. Uh, my main website is edwardwillett.com, just my name.com. Uh, Shadow Paw Press is just shadowpawpress.com. Uh, and the world shapers is the world shapers.com. So not hard to find. You made it pretty uh, easy. And if you look on the social media sites, uh, I'm, I, I'm on Twitter and Instagram, oh, sorry, X and Instagram and, uh, Facebook. And so is the press and 
so was the podcast to a certain extent. But if you start at the uh, if you start at the website, you'll that's probably the main places. Oh, and endless sky books is endless hyphen sky hyphen books dot com for because somebody had what I wanted and I couldn't get it. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and and coming from the prairies, I'm assuming that's where endless sky books came from, right? Well, I wanted to call it living skies because that's our. That's our motto, Land of Living Skies here in Saskatchewan. But that was taken. It was too obvious other people had taken. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they wouldn't let me have it as a business name because it was too close to other business names. Of course. Yeah. Especially in that province. Yeah, of course. Uh, Edward, thanks again so much for hanging out with me today. Thanks for having me on. I always get so excited when I'm talking to somebody who is willing to try something different, is willing to break the boundaries is willing to experiment, stick their neck out, and take a risk. So for the longest time, indie authors have had easy access to digital publishing. I mean, a long time. I mean, in 2004 was when I created uh, my very first self-published book using Ingram Lightning Source print on demand. Now there is Ingram Spark exists now, which is kind of like a Fisher Price-esque front end. Back in the day, Ingram Lightning Source was, you had to really know what you were doing as a publisher in order to navigate that site. Uh, they've dumbed it down uh, a bit. Uh, and, and I'm not making fun of anyone when I say dumbed it down, but they've they've made it a lot more approachable. I mean, Ingram Spark's still kind of clunky in, in, in all its ways, but it's light years ahead of what it was back in 2004 when I was using it in order to do my self-publishing. And there's so many great tools in terms of making a print book or an ebook. And back in 2004, it was not difficult. It was quite a bit more complicated and you had to know a little bit more. Unfortunately, I'd had some experience with uh, printing and uh, print on demand uh, before that. So I kind of understood it a little bit. Of course, working in the book industry definitely helped. But we've always had access to digital access to publishing. So, you know, you can list your books online. They're available in retailers online and in digital format and print on demand, etc. But Edward's taking it to the next step because, and this is something that I often say when I'm giving advice to writers, is even even with my own uh, publishing uh, imprint, Stark Publishing, and and people want, you know, me to publish them, and and I and I have to tell them. I said, yeah, you know, I've worked in the industry for thirty years, and I understand this inside out. I, I created a self publishing platform for Kobo. I work. Uh, I consult part time for Draft to Digital. I have lots of insights into the industry and how it works, and and really understand the movers. And the players and the shakers and all the things that work and don't work, etc. It may not mean that I've been able to do all the things myself. I mean, heck, it's it's so much fun when I see people that I've mentored and people that have been clients of mine who have far surpassed my wildest dreams in terms of what they've earned uh, and, and the way that they've sold. But you know, uh, you, you do what you can. But and, and obviously, I'm very proud of of being able to have helped people in that way. But that being said. Even with all my knowledge and smarts and the things I understand about the industry, I tell the authors who, who work with me with Stark Publishing that there's not really much that I can do for you that you can't do using the exact same tools yourself because they're all available to everyone. So it's not like I have any magic secret thing. Now, the difference is is, is the logistics of me doing it, etc., that can take a lot of, I guess, the angst and burden off of those folks. And so, you know, I take advantage of Drafted Digital's payment splitting because I don't want to have to deal with the, the nightmare of, of you know, I got 18 cents from Amazon Mexico for, for your sales two months ago. You, here's your here's your cut. <laughs> and it cost me more money to transfer you the money than, than either of us earned uh, in that case. And so Drafted Digital takes care of all those, the majority of those payments. And I, and I just manage some of those exceptions manually. And, and again, don't necessarily do it every month. If the volume's huge, yeah, of course, I don't want to be sitting on the money. Uh, but typically, I do that with my co-authors, you know, every six months. Run a report, go, okay, here's the money that was earned in the last six months, and here's here's what you get. So obviously, when a book is a, a front list or a new release, the money's usually pretty, uh, pretty decent at the beginning. So it's usually, you know, the first month or two or whatever. And then we just kind of, as it slides in the back list, just kind of deal with that every six months or so. But I'm, I'm making a big deal about this because typically 
there's nothing uh, uh, here's the here's the benefit that that a real publisher and I and, and I, I don't call myself a real publisher because of, for a few reasons I don't pay in advance I don't pay in advance I don't actually have a staff of editors and et cetera, et cetera. Now, some publishers don't have that. They have freelancers, and I use different freelance editors for different projects and cover design, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't have anything beyond digital distribution. I don't have a sales force uh, or a warehouse or any of those things that a more traditional publisher that actually gets offset printed books, not necessarily just print on demand, in a warehouse where they, they can actually get books into bookstores. And that's the main difference, typically, between what an indie author can do for themselves and what an actual traditional publisher that has this investment in their business. And, and that's a significant difference because when I'm looking at whether I want not I want to license my rights to a publisher, I will usually only license my rights to a publisher because I get that bonus. When I work with Dundurn, for example, Canada's largest independent publisher, they've got my books into Costco, they've got my books into Walmart, they get my books into chain stores and indie stores. I've walked into random bookstores around North America and found my books from Dundurn on the shelf. And that's not something most indie authors can get. You can get it manually, sure. There's, a, there's an Indigo in Cambridge, Ontario that has a bunch of my self-published titles on the shelf. There's another independent bookstore here in Cambridge that has a couple of my self-published titles on the shelf. But for the most part, that's one, one-on-one one relationships that I have that have gotten these books into the store. And that's one of the main differences that a real publisher does. Now, what Edward's doing with Shadowpaw Press is very real publisher stuff. It's high investment, getting access into the warehouses, and I am experimenting. Uh, I have negotiated uh, something with Edward where I could take advantage of the access that he has. I am paying him to sort of sublet some of his warehouse space for a couple of my titles that I believe will would do well. Uh, in in the market, and so I've just today, as ironically as I was editing this uh, interview from many many weeks back, and we might have even done it in in late 2023. Um, but when uh, I, I just filled out a, a very extensive spreadsheet of metadata, and this is not just the Bizac code, like book industry standards and communications. This is all kinds of other codes for book format and, and all kinds of like uh, author country and and you have to provide the HTML text, uh, et cetera, for the description and the author bio and stuff like that. There's just like a really, really extensive spreadsheets. But again, it's part of that experimentation. And uh, but part of the other reason too is I really want to support Edward. And speaking of supporting Edward, he has a crowd a crowdfunder that he is launching and you can get access to some of the really awesome books. Now, we talked about Rob Sawyer. Rob's a, a friend, a mentor of mine, has helped me out. Hey, Rob blurbed my very first book. He blurbed One Hand Screaming back in 2004 for me. Even back when, you know, Rob was one of the people who gave me the advice and says, I don't know about the self-publishing thing. And of course, Rob's done brilliantly well with several of his last titles. Now, this latest title that he just released was an Audible exclusive called The Downloaded. And Brandon Frazier is the, one of the main voices in this dramatic reading. It's a fantastic science fiction story. It's just, it's Rob. It's got Rob all over it. And it's, it's his kind of near future. Well, not near future because it, it goes distantly into the future, but it's using near future technology to talk about stuff. And and some of it takes place uh, here in Waterloo, Ontario, which is kind of cool. I, re I really like that. But anyways, it was an Audible exclusive and uh, Edward has the, the print rights uh, on it. But I'll have a link to the crowdfunder where you can get access to this, you know, directly from uh, Edward and in a way that can help you know, support this this solopreneur, this uh, independent publisher who's really trying to break new ground and experiment and see, is this something that can be made uh, workable? Well, probably I will report back on, on what's working for me and I'll probably have, have Edward come back uh, to report on how it is working for him and for Shadow Paw Press, particularly because he's got some great titles. He's got some 
amazing titles in general, but he's got some reprint stuff. He's got some original editions and some really great books. Uh, I think Rob Sawyer, Dave Duncan, Arthur Slade are three that come to mind off the top of my head that he's publishing. And of course, some of his own backlist stuff that he's gotten the rights back to. But again, I'm always excited and eager to follow people who are breaking new ground, see what they're up to. And uh, like I said, I will report back on all those things. But that is it for my uh, post-interview reflection. That is it for this episode. If you want to support the podcast, of course, you can go check it out over at patreon.com slash stark reflections where you get access to, you know, um, additional bonus things that may be exciting, maybe cool, maybe unique to you. So a uh, huge thank you to all my patrons who support the podcast and a huge thank you to you, dear listener, for listening. Just listening to the podcast actually helps me. Those download stats help me with getting sponsors for the podcast. Never mind, it boosts my ego, and that's always a nice thing, right? If you want to support the podcast, you can always leave a review for the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, uh, or better yet, share the podcast with someone that you think would find value in it. So thank you for listening. So until next week, as always, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.